Al Jazeera podcast. We have achieved soft landing on the moon. India is on the moon. That was the sound at the Indian Space Research Organization when the country became the fourth to land on the moon. This is the new India. Fearless India. Committed India. If it feels to you like we're re-entering the 1960s heyday of space exploration, you're not alone. The new space race is accelerating. It's a new era of exploration and colonization. A space law expert says there could be not millions, not billions, but trillions of dollars in resources at stake. But now, there are far more countries involved. So in this new space race, who's in and who's out? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. When India's rover made its landing back in August, it was the first time any nation had landed near the moon's resource-rich, less explored South Pole. Later this month, Japan will aim to do the same thing. So I talked to someone who's been watching these developments, both up in space and down here on Earth. My name is uh, Namrata Goswami, and I am a professor with the Thunderbird School of Global Management, Arizona State University. And I teach space policy and international relations there. You gave a TEDx not too long ago, um, and you talk about how this interest first got started. You grew up in Northeast India, looking at the night sky with awe. What was it about space that fascinated you? Yeah, so what fascinated me about space were uh, two very meaningful things, actually. One was that as a young girl growing up in this remote mountain town in northeast India, we would lose power very often, and the night sky would sparkle. Losing power did not matter because I could go out and look at space. And I always was fascinated what lay beyond. And then moving professionally, what fascinated me about space was the fact that when you look at international relations, space plays a really critical part in terms of how societies aspired and viewed themselves. So that's what actually fascinated me. And Namrata's not the only one. Space has occupied the human imagination forever. And different cultures have often reflected both excitement and anxiety around developments in space. During the Cold War, that was happening mostly in the U.S. and Soviet Union. I've wondered whether you might be having some second thoughts about the mission. Films like 2001, A Space Odyssey. How do you mean? Rumors about something being dug up on the moon. TV shows like Star Trek. To boldly go where no man has gone before. And Solaris, a Soviet film. The scene is somewhere in the cosmos. The time, the distant future. The place, a planet yet unknown to us. Became cult classics. So Nimrata, now we're seeing more and more countries propelling their ambitions into space. Have you seen that reflected culturally? Uh, Yes, actually, I have. Countries across the world, there are about 74 space agencies today. Uh, Societies across the world are involved in space startups, space economy, space fiction. So China just released a movie called Wandering Earth. And this is an enormous contribution by China to science fiction and the imagination of space. Earth engine system failing. Total, the storyline is dystopian because it sees humanity as destroying Earth and that China has the capability and the willingness to build engines and technology, like 10,000 engines that can propel Earth to a different solar system. Namrata pointed to another interesting film, this one out of India, and loosely based on a true story. Command for launch. Go, go, sir, go. So Mission Mangal, which is India's mission to Mars, is about that particular mission. 
Most importantly, that movie highlighted the role of women, women scientists and engineers, their contribution, their leadership, and their enthusiasm. So those were the very interesting contributions from China and India. As we speak today, a probe from Japan is on its way to the moon. And this year, in 2023, we saw India land a rover on the moon's south pole. So for any of our listeners who might not be paying attention, the moon might seem like old news, been there, done that. But it's seeing a resurgence. Is this about status or resources? So... 2023 has been the moon's year to shine because India's landing on the southern hemisphere of the moon really caught the imagination of the world. Also for the fact that India was able to do it at a very low cost of $75 million compared to, say, just the space launch system that NASA uses for its lunar mission, that cost about $4 billion. Japan's iSpace, a commercial company, also tried to land on the moon uh, in April, but failed in the last few seconds. Japanese moon lander now presumed lost in space. Yeah, moments before touching down, flight controllers lost contact with the spacecraft. The conversation around space today is not what the Cold War conversation was, which was about prestige, technology demonstration, few people getting to space. Today, the conversation is about how space can be utilized for the benefit of humanity and the economic potential of space. And so that particular shift and movement, I don't think is sometimes understood in the West. It has been understood in countries like Japan, Indonesia, as well as in India. But uh, the West has not caught up as yet. You wrote a book called Scramble for the Skies. And in that title is a nod to the Scramble for Africa, which is when European powers carved up the continent and awarded African resources to themselves. And this is around the same time as the colonization of South Asia. Are you seeing that mimicked in the space programs that you research? Do you think we'll see the resources of space carved out for certain countries in a similar way? So if you think about the historical scramble for Africa, that was mostly by the Western nations. And the end goal was, of course, exploitation of African resources to the detriment of those communities and civilizations that flourished in Africa. So if you look at the resource scramble that is happening today, you really do not see a reflection of that as much. There's a language change that Namrata has noticed in her research over the years. For example, while the U.S. used academic discourses a lot about space exploitation, countries like Japan, China, Ghana, Nigeria, they use concepts like space development, uh, space utilization. And so those concepts are much more neutral in terms of what they are looking forward to. And sometimes that difference in language gets lost. Namrata pointed me to another, less expected reason why some countries are heading to the moon. Folklore. So during my fieldwork in China, when I was studying their space program and collecting data, when I asked Chinese thinkers and policymakers about why are they going to the moon, because the reason seems very strategic and all about resources, but they also pointed out that the moon plays a very fascinating and really vital part in China's civilizational history. It's connected to their lunar festival, and the moon is seen as something very dear to them. So I teach uh, courses with the African Space Leadership Institute, and I learn about how the moon is included in songs, for example, in Ghana, in Nigeria. And what is even more heartening for me is that that kind of folklore actually makes it into policy making. So Unlike the U.S., where the moon is seen as a pit stop to get to Mars. So Mars is the important thing. Moon is just a passage to get there. In China and India and Japan's space program, the moon is intrinsically vital for its own sake. But that doesn't mean there's nothing to worry about. There are resources that these countries are interested in. That includes rare earth metals, the kinds used in production of phones and computers, 
There's also something called helium-3, which could be used in nuclear fusion here on Earth. And while space law exists, the rules regulating resources are a little up in the air. What could happen is that the country with the most capable space technology might get a head start and might occupy an established presence in resource-rich areas to the detriment of other nations that do not have that capability. Yeah. Is that the kind of thing that worries you? It concerns me because if I think about low Earth orbit where you have very critical slots for communication, for example, satellite communication, navigation, countries that are actually with capability for launch are going to take over the most beneficial slots. And it's not just countries. The space in Earth's orbit for satellite use is getting crowded with private companies, too. Take, for example, SpaceX, headed by Elon Musk. The company's Starlink satellite network delivers broadband internet around the world, and they're expanding. Starlink will dominate the low Earth orbit constellation, which means that you will have to then depend on them and buy services from them. And Musk has been notoriously fickle in providing access to those services. Elon Musk's company SpaceX said that it is curbing use of its Starlink satellite communication service by the Ukrainian military. Apparently, Ukraine's use of Starlink to guide drone attacks against Russian forces is a no-go. Elon Musk has agreed to operate Starlink in Gaza only with Israel's approval. But that's not the only potential risk. Say a country from Africa, for example, Ghana, wants to also create a constellation. But because Ghana does not have the capability today, it might lose out if we do not create a framework that ensures that certain slots are available in the future. After the break, a look at whether space will stay the domain of a wealthy few. But before we get there... My training data consists of both science fiction and speculative fact. That's my new coworker, Ursula. She's AI, and she's also the host of a new podcast from Al Jazeera and Doha Debates called Necessary Tomorrows. Every week, we'll bring you stories of 2065 and from the 2020s. Science fiction offers up a way to explore the social dynamics here on Earth now, while imagining scenarios we might encounter in the future. And Namrata was part of an episode of Necessary Tomorrows that did just that. So when you're done with this episode of The Take, give them a listen. So, Professor, we've been speaking about the way different countries have been scrambling to lay claims to parts of space. And this might seem high level for someone who has no intention of ever, say, living on Mars. But we all use space every day. Can you explain why we should care about something like Earth's orbit getting crowded? I think we should care deeply because the societies that we inhabit today across the world, space offers critical infrastructure. People don't seem to realize, because space is so invisible as an infrastructure, you can easily talk about road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, computer networks, because you can see them and you use them. But the invisible support that space offers, I don't think people get it. And so people sometimes question, why are we spending so much money on space infrastructure when we have so many other things to do, like poverty alleviation, agriculture, farming? Why do we need space? So I would always point out that without space weather forecasting, you might not be able to do effective agriculture, right? And then GPS. I mean, I had conversations where people told me that, why do I need space for navigation? I have GPS, <laughs> right? And so to make that connection, I think is absolutely vital. And, and people are starting to recognize it, but I don't think we are there yet. 
I think one of the criticisms people have when they think of space being a thing that we shouldn't spend resources on is that it often seems like it is the domain of the wealthy. And while that may be true, costs are coming down. So earlier, you mentioned India's recent moon landing, which was done on a budget. Comparatively, for space, the cost was in the 70 millions. That's less than the cost of Hollywood movies like Gravity or The Martian. Is space travel becoming cheaper? And then if so, what does that mean for countries that have historically been left out of the space race? So space travel is getting cheaper. Reusability of rockets is an amazing contribution to the cost of launch to low Earth orbit come down. One of the rockets that SpaceX is working on is called Starship. It has an ability to launch, if successful, about 140 metric tons to low Earth orbit. And it's reusable. That's a big difference from the single-use rockets that have been used to launch astronauts into space in years past. SpaceX head, Elon Musk, sees Starship as crucial to his long-term vision of building a city on Mars. How do we make life multiplanetary? How do we, what, what's the first step? And um, the essential technology, the, the holy grail breakthrough that's needed is a, a rapid and completely reusable rocket system. And reusable rockets are not just the pipe dream of a billionaire. China has a, just announced a reusable launch vehicle called the Long March 9 with similar capability like Starship. India just tested a reusable launch vehicle. What this means is that nations that do not have that capability today can buy services at a much cheaper cost for their space infrastructure or take examples of India's ecosystem and innovate in that particular perspective. Audiences always ask me, why is it that rockets that we use once and do not use it again do not bring down the cost. All we need to do is manufacture many of them, right? My example is airplanes. Imagine if you had to use your Boeing or Airbus airplanes just once, and then you had to throw it away, and you had to build a new system again completely for the next flight. You would not be able to afford your ticket. A similar future awaits for us in space. Before we get there, though, there will be failure, as there already has been. You mentioned SpaceX's reusable rocket Starship and a Japanese company, iSpace, that tried to land on the moon last year. Both of those initiatives have so far ended in failure. Elon Musk had hoped he'd be seeing SpaceX's Starship system splash down in the Gulf of Mexico today. But the private spaceflight company says contact has been lost with its Starship spacecraft minutes after it reached space. A Japanese company was trying to become the first private business to pull off a lunar landing, but flight controllers lost contact with the spacecraft moments before it planned its touchdown. But it won't always be the case. Do you think that that will help expand access to space for countries that might not have had their own space programs yet? What do you make of private companies trying to access space? I wouldn't call them full failures because they did test several technologies. For example, iSpace. In 2023, successfully entered lunar orbit. That is a big deal for a private commercial company. Now, the final is to land, and we know how difficult that is. India also failed in its first attempt in 2019 and succeeded this year. Now, to your question, what commercial space enterprise has done is that it has actually successfully brought down costs, and they are actually motivated to bring down costs because that means more and more people will use it. Unlike state-funded programs whose incentive is not profit, and that's why they're not really bothered if it's a large tax bill because they don't have to make cases for supporting their space program. So Nimrata, what would democratic access to space look like to you? So for me, if you think about democratic access, I would say that one, it would be first that nations across the world and societies across the world have the capability to access space when they want to. 
And it's not just limited to state funded astronauts or it is those millionaires that can afford a seat. That's unthinkable for almost billions of people across the world. So that's number one, the ability to access space when and if they want to. Second, I think when I talk about democratization of space, the resources in space that exist, there has to be some level of capability to share those resources so that we do not repeat the mistakes of colonial past. That's number two. That would mean democratic access to space. And then finally, regulation. I would say that without regulation that kind of mandates that particular idea that space is the province of humankind, we might not get there in terms of democratic access. Thank you so much for this really interesting conversation. Well, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Nikin Oliayi with Khalid Sultan, Zaina Badr, Sonia Bagad, David Enders, Sadi El Khalili, Chloe K. Lee, Miranda Lynn, Ashish Malhotra, Amy Walters, and me, Malika Bilal. Alex Roldan is our sound designer. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer. And Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs>